Hello and welcome to the first episode of uh, History Boys Abroad, a podcast where we're going to be looking at the kind of individual stories that make up the history of Celtic, while also talking about the kind of current things that are happening at Celtic Park. So my name is Graham, and I'm here with my co-host Tony. How you doing? And we're going to talk about first of all, we're going to introduce ourselves. We're going to talk about uh, how we get started with uh, Celtic, and then we're going to move on to talk about the legend that was uh, Jan Venegar of Hesselink. Tony, you decided to pick Jan Venegar of Hesselink as the first in the kind of uh, history of Celtic podcast that we're doing here. So I think it's yep. only apt that you should introduce yourself first. My name's Tony, currently living in Madrid in Spain, from the south side of Glasgow, been supporting the Celtic for over 30 years. Nice. So yeah, thought Jan Venegura Hesselink was a, a good choice. A friend and I had a conversation about him about two years ago, talking about how he was actually quite a good player and doesn't seem to get applauded, so I thought it was a good idea to talk about him first, and obviously when we had the conversation about starting this, he was appropriate. Okay, I've got a feeling we're going to have some conflict coming ahead in this episode but, uh, after your kind of uh, summary there, but we'll, we'll see what happens later on. Yeah. So, uh, what was your like uh, first kind of uh, season remembering going to Celtic games and like wh- where did you start out? Well, my earliest memory of Celtic that I can visually remember of a game was the Tommy Burns testimonial against mm-hmm. Liverpool. I always remember the, him throwing his boots into the crowd. And I, I was in the main stand with my dad, and I always thought, that's fucking weird, man, throwing your boots away. You don't <laughs> me, but um, previous to that, in the jungle as well, being pushed under the turnstiles as a kid, like really small kid, and uh, my dad's just, <laughs> I was speaking to my dad today, and he was telling me that the, the one of the first games I went to, if not the first game I went to, I was nine months old, which goes against all the health and safety issues these days, but I, I was in Celtic Park before I was one years old, so it's been a while. Nice. That's that's the way to get it kind of started, you know. Yeah. Uh, for for me, the, the first I can remember is uh, it was Celtic Dundee. Yeah. Uh, I think it was the season before Hamden. Carol Muggleton was in goals for Celtic, uh, and the game finished one each. Uh, Tom Boyd scored an OG from like a, a miss kick from the oh. left hand side of the goal. It was a uh, pretty horrific. Not goal. A classic. <laughs> no, no, no. It was a bad way to start. Yeah. Uh, and the following season, we went to like the the Blackburn. Uh, Friendly at Hamden. Yeah. And then after that, the Blackburn season, the Hamden season happened, and then I got my season ticket, and I had my season ticket for like uh, 11 years, I think it was. Yeah. So I actually, my, I gave up my season ticket in uh, Jan Vinegar of Hesselink's second season, the end of his second season. In his second season, oh. Yeah. After probably maybe his uh, most triumphant moment as well. So. Yeah. Yeah, but we'll, we'll get to that later. Yes, we will. <laughs> so you told you told us why you thought about Jan Vinegar of Hesselink. Yeah. Give me your impression, of, like your overall impression of him as a player. I seem to remember him scoring quite important goals, but he didn't score a lot, and he always seemed to be either being subbed during <laughs> a match or not playing at all, and. He has just, in my head, he's always stuck out as someone that got a bit of a raw deal. I think mm-hmm. it was because he was in, up front with uh, McDonald, who seemed to get more abuse, but at the same time more plaudits, and they seem to have this uh, this relationship. But, mm-hmm. yeah, I just think that he is appropriate for us to, to talk about in this podcast, um, and we'll get into that. I, I sent him a little kind of a... Uh... Cheeky tweet mm. uh, asking if he wanted to appear, but unfortunately, I never heard anything back. So yeah, I had a, a wee look at his Twitter yesterday. He's not the most active, and I think he's yeah. um, he's actually a, a scout for PSV and he's an international scout, and he's always posting photos from different countries, Dubai, and all that sort of stuff. But yeah, he's um, anyway. Well, yeah, what, maybe what is he play, what is he playing at? Pretending that Dubai will have plenty of players. I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea what he's pretending to be in Dubai for. Yeah, certainly not players in Dubai. There's nothing in Dubai. There's nothing in Dubai, as far as I'm concerned. 
I think like the fact I think why I have maybe a kind of negative opinion of a yeah. B- a Big Yan was the fact that so the season before he joined mm. which was 2005-2006 uh, yeah. we had a, a straight force of uh, John Hartson and uh, uh, Zuravsky Aye. Zuravsky was never the best player but he got the goals I mean he scored I think 20 or something that season mm. the season before that we had uh, Hartson, Sutton and Bellamy up front yeah and the season before that, obviously, we had, we had Hink with like the 40, 48 goals or something yeah. he scored that season. And I remember exactly where I was when I thought, yeah, this has come to the end of something. I was in, I was on a balcony in uh, Ibiza, still, still drunk from the night before, uh-huh. and when my mates went down to get like a, a newspaper, and the newspaper said that we were replacing Henry Larson with Henri Camera. Yeah, that was a tough one to take. <laughs> but that was like the beginning of the end. So when it became to like uh, Jan Vinegar of Hesselink, I think I was just like totally scunnered by the fact that we were downsizing so much. Yeah. And I probably had a more negative opinion of him than, than he deserved. Yeah. I think his his record... Now, as someone that's played Chapman forever, um, <laughs> I always remember seeing his name, and obviously he's got this bonkers name. And uh, if you want to talk about his name, we can do that now. Um, <laughs> go for it, let's go for it. Right, so if you want to get your your uh, Celtic strip with uh, Venegul's name in the back, have you any idea how much it would cost? No idea. It's going to cost you the best part of 20 euros, which is probably about 17 quid. But right. I was on the Celtic website last night, the Celtic store, and they only allowed 10 letters. That so is a disgrace. And Mackay, <laughs> Mackay Stephen, Kaz and Richards, that's double digits, so I fuck knows what's going on with that. <laughs> but um, but Kazim Richards just calls himself the Big Z or something Big like that, Z, doesn't he? Big yeah. Z, well, I have no idea. <laughs> but yeah, um, the Venegar name. Do you know the answer before I before I reveal this? No, I, I take it. My my assumption is that he's like, Hesselink is a place. Well, and and that's where he's from. Actually, you're pretty much no far off of it. I've got these pieces of paper here and my fans blown them all over the place. <laughs> uh, so basically, um, I think it was in the 17th century, two well-respected, socially established families intermarried. And um, instead of one taking the other name and forgetting their name, they thought, fuck it, let's uh, join them up and have this stupidly long name. So, yeah, he's from Venegur and from Hesselink, and the two of them married in the 17th century. It's actually found it on the Guardian website of all places. It was one of those <laughs> questions that's regularly asked, so it wasn't too difficult to find out. But anyway, I it's going to cost you 20 euros if you want his name. So, so what is the off? Is that like R in uh, Dutch or something? I have no idea. I really don't know the answer to that, but it is still a banging name. And if, if, only podcast, you, if, yeah. Yeah. if only we knew someone that had a Dutch uh, like girlfriend or something, <laughs> then maybe we would get to the bottom maybe of this. I, maybe I. <laughs> she's from Glasgow, but she doesn't speak any Dutch at all yet. She's still... Right. They don't need to speak English over uh, Dutch and Holland anyway. But yeah, his <laughs> name and uh, the first time that I came across him was in Champman. And then when it came to him signing for Celtic, I had a little bit of knowledge about him, but it was just Champman knowledge, which everyone will have at some stage. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But the research has led me to find that, wait a minute, he was actually quite a shite pun, but a big name. He was actually doing quite well for PSV <laughs> and to the point we bought him. So, what what are we talking here? Like what kind of what kind of goals? He scored. I think he scored approximately 22 goals uh, in one season for them. He was only there for three years, I think. Seems to have a habit of playing for teams for three years. He was only there, uh, t- I think it was 22 goals in one season, which he was the top scorer. Do you know who he was playing alongside in PS? Two. Robin, Koku. Huh. He was playing alongside Van Bommel. He was playing up front with Van Nistelrooy for the Dutch national squad. He's played with a lot of quality players. Afalai, Farfan, even um, Alex that played for Chelsea and played for PS, uh, PSG. He's played with all these absolutely class players and then he came to Celtic. So And played with Barry Robson. Barry Robson <laughs> and uh, Paul Hartley. But we'll yeah. get to that. And, uh, yeah, we'll get to that. But so, so before we go in much further, I was doing a bit of... Uh, I'm, I'm on the, the huddle board mm-hmm. and uh, I was doing a bit of research. I typed in uh, his name, well, parts of his name, and uh, I wanted to see what kind of, I wanted to see what the reaction was like in the build up to assigning him. So I've got some kind of like uh, snippets of what people were saying just before we signed him. 
So right. there were there were doubts. We can't afford them. It won't come because he's already part of the Dutch national team. Uh, then someone said he'd be a good foil for Kenny Miller. <laughs> Fucking hell, man! <laughs> apparently, <laughs> uh, Timoshek was apparently supposed to sign at the same time as yeah. Uh, Vinegar. Yeah. And then there was like someone putting up a. A please and praying emoticon, you know, like the, the emoticon with someone praying, yep. hoping that we sign them. Someone said, quotation, fantastic cap capture, great quality. And then, like, there was a deal off uh, thread where people thought that the deal wasn't going to happen. And that went for six pages because people were so yes. irate at Celtic not signing them. And then, so we, we go forward to a uh, kind of a few months or a year till uh, to Vinegar's actually playing for us. And we've got quotes like, Big Lassie, most of the time. <laughs> Samaras is ten times the player. Pishit holding the ball up. Jan Verger of Hesselink will not do as a Celtic Celtic a Celtic centre forward. Bambi on ice. Right. Drop him, this, this is my favourite. Drop him now, give Chris Killing a chance. Jesus Christ. And then in Poster, worst first choice Celtic striker since Tony Cascarino. Nah, it's just absolute nonsense. <laughs> and then just to just to top it off, when when he goes on to leave Celtic, uh, some of the quotes from that. Cheers for Tanadice and that late hun goal, but fuck <laughs> off. <laughs> and then the second one was the physio will miss him, and that's something that I was a bit surprised at because I can't remember him being that that injured like that often. Yeah. See, as I said earlier on, I think my memory of him has not been able to last 90 minutes because he has that kind of odd frame, that shape that he sort of slumps about the pitch because he's a big guy in that. But mm -hmm. yeah, he's um, it's interesting that you get all those, yes, 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 please get him. And then two months later, everyone's like, oh, he's fucking shit. It's just a classic example of online forums. Bro. It's, it's unlike the internet to be hyperbolic. Absolutely. You know? I know. I'm, I'm genuinely surprised. <laughs> So do you want to take it like season by season? Like it's going into his first one, which was two thousand six, two thousand seven. We yeah. signed him on the twenty first, twenty fourth of August. Yeah. For apparently three point four million pounds. Point four million pounds. It's yeah. a lot of money. It is. Celtic. I mean, yeah, yeah. That's a lot of money for Celtic. Yeah, his first season. Do you remember who scored his first goal? And in fact, do you know the circumstances behind his first goal? I think did he, did he score like a couple of days after signing, like on his debut? I think when he signed, he wasn't fit. <laughs> so <laughs> I think he wasn't just like, I don't know if he was like unfit or he was like injured. I think it was just lacking match fitness, to be honest. But he came off the bench to score the winner against Hibs. Mm -hmm. I can't even remember if it was Celtic Park or not, but um, let's pretend it was. But anyway, <laughs> do you know who scored the goal for Hibs? Okay, so you've asked that, so it must be someone like uh, Derek Ryden. No, Derek Ryden was in the Scot. Uh, the Celtic. I'm pretty sure Ryden was in the team. At that he was point. already with us. Okay. Uh, Scott Brown. Scott Brown. Oh, there we go. Scott it's... Brown. Remember, he used to score goals. <laughs> he hasn't done it for a long time for Celtic, but yeah. he, he used to score goals. But um, one other question on this while we were talking about this: Who set the goal up for for Celtic? Uh, Aye. I'm going to say. I imagine it's like a cross from the wing, so I'm going to say Lee Naylor. See, you think that he would be quite a danger with the head. Like, you thought that because <laughs> he's a big guy, he's going to score hundreds of goals, we see. My research has led me to find that he only scored like 10 goals, we said. I think he only scored maybe 40 or 50 goals for Celtic Max overall. Mm -hmm. Only approximately a quarter with his head. So uh, he, wasn't actually, he wasn't actually that great with, with the in the air, but any other ideas to say who set this up? Because you're going to want to set yourself on fire when you find out. So it's going to, it must have been like on on the ground. Uh, I'm going to say someone like I don't know Barry Barry Robson. <laughs> nah, Barry Robson's a good guy. It was that fucking Kenny Miller. Miller. Kenny Miller. Yeah. Unfortunately, <laughs> Kenny Miller was the guy. Yeah. According to my research, which is, goes as far as transfermarkt.com, uh, <laughs> told me that Kenny Miller set that up when Kenny Miller was. Just an alright guy. Now he's just a. We don't even want to talk about that. <laughs> but anyway, I, he set up with the goal and it was two one. And then I can't really remember how many goals he scored in his first season. I don't think he was prolific. I think he he peaked in his second season certainly. And I got I, from from what I wrote down, I got eighteen goals in thirty games. 
18 gold. Now that's a decent return. But one of, one of it seemed from my, from my research, it seemed to be that he, he went for like long periods without scoring, and then he would score, like he scored a hat trick against St. Mirren. So he seemed to have kind of big gaps in yeah. between. So he wasn't the most prol- prolific. So yeah, no, that that's true. But uh, to go back to um, his debut, uh, as I say, it was kind of. It's that classic debut that you always want, especially when the guys get a mad weird name. <laughs> Foreign guys are always slightly better for some reason. Like George Cadetti. George Cadetti, <laughs> like fucking hell, the long hair and that Latin <laughs> looks. But basically, um, ah, he came, obviously he comes off the bench to score the winner, which is like instant fan hero, you know? Mm-hmm. And obviously the reason they're doing this is because maybe he hasn't achieved, not necessarily legendary status, but obviously a status that he deserves, in my opinion. But mm-hmm. um We'll discuss that. Uh, yeah. Anyway, I think the Man United game is the well. Yeah, he has, in my opinion, four big moments as a Celtic player. But one of them happened in his first season. One of them happened in his first season, and that was the Man United game, where, um, which is probably remembered more for Nakamura. Yeah, yeah. I, I was actually at that game. Uh, Old he scored so early that uh, we were kind of unsure whether to celebrate because we were at the. We were actually at that end. And uh, among among the the, the, the Man U fans, and I ran down the stairs into the kind of like concourse and stuff, jumping up and down because I wasn't sure if I could celebrate. But when when we got back up, like one of the guys saw our scarves and he, he, he shouted in this Cockney accent, "What you guys? What what are you doing here?" And we were like, "I think we're probably like closer to fucking Manchester than you Aye. guys are." So yeah, no, I, I was at that game and. Uh, I, I, the first thing I remembered saying to saying to you earlier was like I just remember he filled uh, Rio Ferdinand. It was in my, like you know how yeah. like John Hartson when he scored against Celta Vigo, you were thinking, oh, that could have been a foul. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It felt like that for like the the Man U goal as well. He like kind of bundled him off the ball. Yeah, he pushed he pushed Ferdinand, which was um, quite a talking point in in the reports and that. Mm-hmm. And uh, the the thing that I remember the most about that was. I thought Van der Sar should have saved it, but then I look back and I'm thinking, maybe not, but it seemed like a really timid shot. It looked it looked as if to me, you know, like uh, these tall goalkeepers sometimes jump over the ball. Yeah, it looked as if the ball was like almost uh, too too close to him to actually Yeah. To actually to stop it. But... Yeah. It shouldn't it shouldn't have gone in, whatever. Like it shouldn't have yeah. shouldn't have been a goal. But But that's not a bad I mean, we're talking in his first month at Celtic, he scored the winner off the bench in his first game and then scored and Man United when we used to be able to, to play these teams and give them a, a, a good uh, game but, uh, so yeah he has that and he obviously has two other moments in my opinion that are extremely special but I mean that season in general like that was uh, a, a league and cup double and yeah. we got to the last 16 of the, the, the Champions League so I mean he came did in they, did they not score against Barcelona? that was that was not that season that was the next season I think it was yeah yeah, yeah. but uh the next season we also got to the last six and I think we can we can move on to that now because okay. uh, uh, so the next season he was partnered uh, with uh, Scott McDonald for the first time yes and the I've infamous got... partnership the infamous little and large that yeah is what everyone wants four four two tall guy wee guy and they're going to score for fun which uh, two two wingers two wingers yeah, yeah. so he scored uh, 20 and 46 I've got and right. uh, McDonald scored 31 and 52 games Right, so uh, can you say that again? Was that over 50? Uh, 20 and 46 games, so like it's just, uh, just over a, a, a goal over two games. Right, okay. I, I, there's certain, like I'm never like that negative about Celtic players because I think what's the point when you're supposed to be supporting yeah. them? But Scott McDonald was someone I really, really, really disliked. And I disliked him because he, I dislike the fact that he kind of arrogantly claimed the, the number seven jersey. Uh, I disliked him for the fact that he was kind of. Uh, it didn't look as if he was looking after himself, like physically as well. Yeah. See, I, I, on my, my internet travels last night, I came across that photo of him when he scored the goal and he lifts his top up and points at his belly. Aye. Do you remember that? Aye. He got this kind of shite six pack, <laughs> a, a bit of a fat belly, and a, but he actually has a wee bit of, of a six pack. But Aye. Still, yeah, he. he he took that to heart, obviously, and thought he had to show off his sixth five. But anyway, uh, but I mean, like it was. I think Strachan had this reputation of making people run, but when you look at like uh, Arthur Boric at the time, he was taking the piss about his fitness as well. You know, what I mean, it wasn't just like it seemed to be a thing that was happening under Strachan, even though he had the reputation as a kind of fitness guy. Yeah, I think Boric was undroppable. To be fair, though, and um, I think he knew that some players just know that they can get away with that. Aye, aye. Yeah, 
But uh, I, I don't know, like, I think my love for Larson was kind of uh, getting in the, in the way of McDonald's as well. Like, I just think I still held on to the kind of idea that we should have better forwards at our team. Yeah. And he was only scoring because he was, like, mooching about the the 18 year box, you know? Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so that was 7-8. Uh, uh, we won the league again. And... Uh, this was my this was my last season as a as a Celtic season ticket holder. I started in the the Paolo Di Canio season, right? Uh, so the last Tommy Burns season, uh, I came through Wim Janssen, uh, Venglas, Barnes, uh, Martin O'Neill, yeah. and uh, this was my last season. I moved to Munich. The game I moved to Munich the week before the last game of the season. Yeah. So I actually watched the the Tannadice game in the, the Shamrock Irish Bar in Munich. Uh, the Shamrock Irish Bar. So, so let, let me ask you this question then. As a, I don't want to peek this too soon, but what is your lasting memory of Venegar? What, when you think of Venegar, where do you go? Where does your brain take you to? What's the memory? I think about like coming because I was a, a member of Barhead St Mary's uh, supporters bus. I don't know if you remember. We always had that massive uh, football top, the, the massive yeah. Celtic top. Yeah, banner. yeah, yeah. That was yeah. Our, that was ours. Uh, and the guys in there were always like they just fucking told it straight and uh, the thing they always said about Vinegar was he was 6 foot 2 standing and he was 5 foot 4 when he jumped and that's something you were talking about with his headers he didn't seem to have any kind of like presence up front Yeah. he didn't seem to have any pace no, and he wasn't himself. yeah and he wasn't the most prolific <laughs> striker of all time either and like yeah. When we look on, look forward to when he left us, he went to Hull and he scored three goals in thirty one games. And yeah. I don't know for me, like it 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 was a kind of negative part of my uh, my my Celtic sport life because it was after the the good times. It was just when I was leaving Glasgow, I had that negative feeling. You, even though you know you're going on to do something good, that you feel as if man, I'm fucking leaving my my hometown here. Yeah, yeah. And like I even remember, I had this massive fucking argument with my mum. Because she didn't want me to be leaving Scotland, and it was a night of Celtic Barcelona when when Benegar scored. Yeah, and like all those things came together where I just had this fucking negative feeling about Jan Benegar Fesslink. So it's a more personal thing then. I think it is. I <laughs> I think if we I think if we brought Benegar into like the the current Celtic team like last season, I think Benegar would be fine. But I think in like comparison to what he was following. He had a uh, had a kind of raw deal. Well, here's a question. Then let me ask you this: Do you think we could attract a player just now? That, in context, he's coming from the Dutch Champions. He's capped for Holland. He's playing alongside Robin Bommel, Van Bommel, uh, Koku. He played up front with Nistelrooy. All these players, these mm-hmm. genuinely world class players, at one point. Do you think Celtic? could afford to bring someone in like him now or even in the past four or five years do you think he would be able to do that I don't know like there, there, there's a thing and I don't know if you listen to the football weekly podcast or the, the Guardian one do, do you listen I do, to yeah. it yeah. I do yeah they always talk about like uh, hot, uh, like Dutch strikers being like uh, their goals being like dog years yeah and uh, for me like I mean Samurai scored like I, I mean I love Samurai he's a big beautiful bastard <laughs> but like he scored twenty odd goals in a season for Heronbeen, you know what I mean? And I think he was probably only nineteen when he done that. Yeah. Because he went to Man United Man City when he was about twenty one. Exactly, yes. The rest of his history. But you're right with the Dutch league, it seems to have this emphasis on attacking with the total football, I guess. But yeah. The, um and many the, players have scored so many goals and went on to do shit. Like Alfonso Alves, remember he signed from Middlesbrough? Yeah. Alves, <laughs> he is one that sticks out. Um, Graziano Pelli, I yeah, guess. Yeah. I suppose he's doing all right just now. But Kesman as well. Like uh, Kesman, yeah. he scored for fun there and then done for call at Chelsea and, and every other team he played at. You've always got but, the gem, like the Van Nistelrooy, you've got the Luis Suarez, you've got the Jan Klaas Huntler, you know what I mean? You've always got those ones, but I think the kind of... The dross like outweighs that, yeah. You know? But coming to a league like Scotland, it's obviously a different thing for going for the small, you know, the small Dutch league to to the English big league to, and if you compare it with the small, the bigger Dutch league and with a slightly smaller Scottish league, it's probably more of a comparison. But but yeah, the, I yeah. mean, my question to you would be like, so we spent three, almost three and a half million on him at the time. When we had recently spent like six million on on Sutton, 
if you took that to like today, just say just say we spent five million on someone who'd been Dutch capped, played for PSV up front and scored twenty odd goals in the Dutch league, and then Jan Vinegar of Hesselink turned up, would you be happy with that? Probably not. Yeah. I just feel like I looked at his like uh, international record. He scored three goals in nineteen games. Yeah, and they all came in friendlies. Yeah, it says a lot, really. One of one and, of them uh, was against Thailand. <laughs> well, there you go, big game. I mean, you make a good point about. I would genuinely struggle to try and remember an attribute that he has that stands out. But he did score important goals, which let's let's talk about the important goals then. Like the the the, the seven eight season is where he got two of them. Aye. So I mean, like the the so the the big it was it basically scored two important goals within like almost within a month of each other. It was like April and May. Yeah. The April game against uh, uh, Rangers. The 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 the, the Rangers. The, the, no, yeah, this was this was the original the original ah, Rangers. Just the Rangers. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean that game was 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 amazing. You know, like obviously the, the Nakamura goal. And then the fact that we scored in the last seconds of the match, it was like this the switch around because you would expect like Vinegar of Hesselink to nod it down to Scott McDonald, but it was like switched around, you know, it was like oh. Scott McDonald nods it down to Vinegar and goal. Well, yeah. The thing that stood out for me most in that game, well, I, I, obviously there are there are three huge moments in that game. The first one is obviously Vinegar's goal to score mm-hmm. at the end. Uh, the second was Nakamura's finish. The third is Gary Caldwell's pass to Nakamura. <laughs> And he also set up Scott McDonald. <laughs> yeah, I was like, talking. To, hell, man. <laughs> I was talking to my brother about this. I was like, he set up both of those goals, man. Gary <laughs> yeah, Caldwell playing in central mid, like fuck's sake, man. <laughs> but he's, I mean, his pass to Nakamura wasn't wasn't the best. But Nakamura had to do a lot with that, you know. what I mean, he had to fucking yeah. tr- control it from like his 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 middle. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but but yeah, the yeah obviously. The, the the midweek game and obviously it was midweek because it was dark yeah that's when uh, you know it's midweek <laughs> yeah of course and um, night time as well obviously but yeah it was the the Nakamura goal to set it up and then that wee Dick Novo scored which was a pretty fucking gallus goal to be fair and then obviously I think I, I can't remember it was 89th minute or something like that and it's just the perfect and the goal itself was actually a really good goal and yeah for me, that's probably his second best moment um, as a as a Celtic player. And yeah, the place went absolutely bananas. I've got a friend that was at the game. I wasn't at the game, and he says he was physically lifted up by random men and moved down six or seven rows in his seat, yeah, uh, down, yeah. down towards like the the, the the touch line, and he sat halfway up the, the stadium. Yeah. So yeah, it's, uh, it was a very special night. But yeah, the I think the most important thing was obviously the. Um, the Dundee United game that you watched in Munich. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that was his um, seventy-two minutes, yeah. and it's still nothing each. Seventy-two minutes, and obviously, if if you watch the game back, you see the moment when the fans find out, and the fans know when Aberdeen have scored, mm-hmm. and the fans are going mental. And then I think whatever happens, the Celtic have scored, and then it, the, the, I'll never forget. The, the camera pans the, the, the sky and you see the helicopter bringing the trophy. Yeah. And you're just like, fucking hell, it's actually happening, man. <laughs> yeah. I, I, like, for me, because it was, uh, when when I moved over to, over to Munich, I, I, you, you've experienced this as well, like, as as we said at the start of the show, we are, we are history boys abroad. We're both kind of, uh, I don't like the expression, but expats. And, expats, yeah. yeah. And like it's, I think only expats understand this. Like just before that happened, I'd gone like I'd just got into Munich a week. My girlfriend had been there before me, and she'd organised a little holiday to Prague. Yeah. So we went to Prague for a weekend, and then see see when you're like when you've just moved to another country and you go on holiday, and then after that holiday you come back to the new country you've moved in. My yeah, that's a head fuck. It, like I had so much depression. You know what I mean? Like I just didn't feel like I was. I wanted to be home. You know what I mean? I wanted yeah. to have the home comforts, and I yeah. like, I come back from holiday and I still wasn't home. Yeah. And then like the next night was that game, and I just met these guys in Munich. Guys that have been doing this for a few years. Guys that have been yeah. following Celtic in Munich. And it yeah. just it, for me that game just felt like coming home as well. You know, it was like these these are guys that I want to fucking watch the games with, and yeah. we've just won the league. You know what I mean? It was yeah. it was an amazing moment. Yeah, I remember when I watched it. Um, I've got. 
being from this, I'm from the south side of Glasgow, but I've got a large amount of friends from Dumbarton area, or mm-hmm. as they call it, the Shire. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, a heavy Celtic region. Mm-hmm. And um, I ended up in one of these bars down in Dumbarton with my friend and some of his friends, and um, it's next to the railway station. And I, I can't remember the name. It's quite a, quite a famous bar. Oh my goodness, man! What a fucking night the place was. Uh-huh. Absolutely. I mean, it was obviously going to be rocking everywhere, but it just felt exceptionally. Wild in there, Taunton. Dunbarton's got a bit of a reputation for being full of mad, good, crazy <laughs> guys. So it, it was, it was unbelievable. And as I say, the vinegar thing. And um, another thing that I, I picked up on when I was watching it back was that um, Lennon was actually the coach at the time. So Lennon was involved in that. And we also see the players that he was playing up. He, he was in his team at that point. We had uh, Robson, uh, Donati, we had Zerafsky. We had fucking Riordan. And you think back, it's like insane to think you had these players. But I think one thing that gets overlooked for that game was Paul Hartley's contribution. Yeah, uh, yeah. Paul Hartley was pinging them in. And obviously it was his corner that um, Benegur scored from. So he's another player that's probably worth talking about somewhere down the line. Um, because he made a, an impact at Celtic where he was, you know, he's coming from... Hearts or wherever he came from, he wasn't expected to do much, but he actually made an impact. Same with Barry Robson. And and the thing about Hartson was he came from Hearts and uh, was immediately told to switch his roles. You know, like yeah. at, at Hearts he was like a kind of a Petrov player where he would break it into the box, and then when he came to Celtic, he was expected to be like a defensive midfielder. Yeah, I think like you mentioned people there like uh, like uh, Edinati. And uh, we've had a kind of problem over the last few years where I think we must have been the last club in the world that has adopted a non four four two formation. And like, of course, you get like teams like Atletico Madrid and Leicester that have a four four two, but that's a totally different four four two. That's not the same thing. Yeah. So, see when you look at players like Donati, Key as well, Key Sung Young, uh, even yeah. even Beaton before Neil Neil Lennon left, those players cannot play in a four four two. Nak- yeah. The fact that we that it's a scandal that we played Nakamura on the right wing of a four four two. I think Strachan had this 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 idea of playing players on the wrong side so they cut in more, but surely that just makes them more predictable. Yeah, you know, I, mean, I think he had McGady on the the left, was it in in Nak on, right? on the right, something like that, and it was just like. Can you, can you imagine like, the formation that we played last season with either McGady or Nakamura as at number ten position? They would, they would have fucking destroyed teams, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, Nakamura would have been playing balls through for Griffiths all day or taking shots on, you know, it's... It, but, I, let, let me ask, sorry, well, well, I have a question in my head. Let me ask you about the, um, obviously we spoke about Vinegar in this, this partnership that he supposedly had with uh, McDonald, and obviously mm-hmm. they scored quite a lot of goals, and you could argue that some of their goals were more important, but we just had Griffiths score 40 goals on his own. Mm-hmm. Would you rather play... Um, do you think someone like Venegur would be good alongside a Griffiths? Do you think he would do well against a Griffiths? Because Griffiths is not the same type of player as McDonald. He's zippier. He can score goals from outside the box. He scores headers. He scores free kicks, etc. I think, look, looking back at that season, like uh, just just looking on, on, online, we, we, the goals were very concentrated that season, so much so that we didn't have... Uh, any, anyone else above 10 goals there was no one else in the squad above 10 goals that season yeah so so between those two they scored 51 goals and then we didn't have anything yeah. else so that was basically our, our attacking pro, pro, prowess was through those two players yeah when it comes to someone like Griffiths I'm not Griffiths' biggest fan like I think like I think to myself I, I would prefer a more intelligent striker I would prefer a, like I think that formation that Ronnie Dyler was, was trying to play needed a different kind of striker and that was one of the problems that, that Dyla actually had. Yeah. And I don't know if uh, I don't know if uh, Reg- Rogers is going to have the same kind of problem because like Chris Davis was interviewed today talking about uh, Davis he was talking about like it'll, maybe it'll be a one one up front maybe it'll be two different different basically he was saying like horses for horses you know what I mean so I think I think for me um to to, to go off track for just one second from from the vinegar thing for me it's about the problem Dyla had was was trying to play players and he had a system that weren't suited and just like forcing it, just try to push it through, like and it wasn't happening. Whereas I would rather see the manager just play players to their strengths. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. You, you can see yeah. that, but like I don't know, like for me, I think I think we're going to be talking about more modern stuff uh, later. Uh, yeah, maybe okay. we can do more of that later. But yeah, that's no, fine. For me, like someone like 
when you come to a club, especially someone like Dyla who's not really known, you will want to either, like, he would want to have stamped his authority in that team right away. And for me, yeah. that would have meant getting a striker in that would have been like a... See someone like... He's totally underrated by his own team, but like, see someone like Giroud. Yeah. That's that's exactly kind of forward that uh, that I think Dyla wanted. Like, someone yeah. like that. Like, even some like fucking... I know all the Celtic fans don't like him that much, but Stephen Fletcher. Yeah. What the, and I think the last game of this season actually it actually kind of sh- uh, showed it quite well was like see when Ryan Christie was up front by himself. Yeah. The amount of kind of like uh, the way that he brought in the three behind them was was better than any point during the season where Griffiths was playing up front. Yeah. Griffiths scored goals, but the the kind of connection between the front four wasn't there as well as when Ryan Christie was up front. I think. Yeah. No, I think that's a good point, but. I think, thing, I, would, yeah, I yeah. think Vinegar and Griffiths together as a strike force, I think they would have scored a lot of goals together. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, so to go back to, to Vinegar, um obviously I'm still trying to think of something that he was good at. <laughs> but obviously his his his, um, his PS de resistance was absolutely the the goal against Dundee United. Yeah. Um the circumstances around that were quite mm, unusual and special. I think it was maybe two or three days before it. Obviously, the Deed Huns were playing in Manchester mm-hmm. in a, that final. How but did also, that happen? <laughs> I have no idea. I have no idea how that happened. Oh, God. <laughs> I'm so fucking glad. I was living in Glasgow at that time, and I was so fucking glad they lost, man. I was, was glad just, to be getting oh, out of the country Jesus before that Christ. happened. So. <laughs> that was, it was incredible. But Tommy Burns died, I think. I think Tommy Burns died the day after that European final, which was the Thursday. They played the Wednesday, I think, or something like that, and then we played a couple of days later. Mm-hmm. And also, obviously, we had that, which which was a heavy weight on, on the club. When Venegar scored, he was pointing his hand to the sky, which is obviously a nod mm-hmm. to Tommy Burns. So the emotions were running high, and that's, to me, which... That 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 whole moment with the club and with, with Venegar scoring that goal, he was just part of it, but that, for me, is... Why he is probably a modern day, modern day like Celtic, not great. I don't want to use the word great or legend or too strong, but someone who should be remembered more fondly. Um, and that's why we're talking about him, I guess. But yeah, it's. Um, I, I, yeah, I can totally see that. I mean, when you, when you look at his over overall record, I think it was forty four goals in one hundred eight games, which which for a, for a forward in Celtic's kind of modern era, that's pretty good. Especially when you consider he was like the second forward, you know, he wasn't like the kind of uh, goal scoring forward. So yeah, I mean that's a, that's a good record, you know. Yeah, his last season he kind of uh, let himself down a bit. I think it was six six goals in thirty two games. Yeah, he done he didn't do very well. Um, I think he was he was two two goals ahead of Caldwell McManus and Livens. <laughs> yeah, says a lot, really. It says a lot. Um, yeah, he didn't seem to do too well in his last season, and which which turned out to be. The final year of his contract anyway I'm pretty sure that when he signed the deal with Celtic he had uh, three years with an extra year option when obviously yeah. you know, Celtic said right we're done or he said we're done but it, obviously it transpired that he moved on to Hull and then Rapid Vienna I think and then I think he maybe I can't remember he maybe went somewhere else but PSV, I think he his PSV. back to PSV and obviously he, he only scored that, seven goals after he left us it says a lot, doesn't it? Yeah, and uh, he played, what's that, 50, 58 games. He played for Hull, Rapid Vienna and PSV after he left us, and he almost got seven goals. That yeah, doesn't seem like a lot, but he, I, I also remember he retired quite young, maybe about 33. Mm. I don't think he was like, you know, you know like Barry Robson's 37 or something like that now, and he's just, <laughs> just retired, but Benegur, as I say, he had that weird frame, that shape that he sort of ran about, he sort of carted himself about the pitch. No. And um, he wasn't like, Maybe he wasn't naturally fit. Who fucking knows? But for me, his uh, absolute moment for Celtic and why I think we are talking about him is, is the Dundee United thing. And it's probably for sentimental reasons more than anything because of what it meant for the mm-hmm. club at that point. But yeah, that for me is something that is etched into my brain forever and ever. I'll never forget that. I mean, these players, like the they, they come along and like they just... They, they just need to do one thing, and that will get them into kind of like Celtic Fortlow forever. You know, what I mean, like yeah. if any any of us any of us listening to this podcast met Jan Berger of Hisslink, you would buy him a fucking drink. You know what I mean? Because because yeah. he did it. You know, he 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 scored against the Huns. 
he won as the league in the last day. You know, I mean, he he was there. He, I mean, he was fighting for us. So. Yeah, I mean, see, see, I, I just want to say that the the Celtic Wiki website has been great for some of this information. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a great website. But see, have you read any of his quotes when he spoke about Celtic during his time and also after his time? No, I have not. No, it's absolutely incredible. Some of the stuff he says is just. He, he's talking about it's more than a football you know he's saying the whole Barcelona thing but it's more than a football club the traditions the history the warmth you have to experience it every day to really understand it and he talks about how he never realised how big Celtic were until he left and all that and he's just like absolutely in love with the club you should you should. I, I recommend everyone that should, that's um, listening uh, to, go and, to go and read up on what he's been saying obviously I haven't heard them say these words myself so it could be made up but you know I like to think that he I'm led to believe he is a genuinely nice guy Apparently, um, apparently he was nicknamed the Radiator, <laughs> and not because he was a big hot guy, because he wasn't really he was a, bit of a shite, shite barnet. But apparently, according to Strachan, because he's very charismatic, he was very um, passionate and uh, always positive, dead charming, and quite good to have around in the squad. So he was nicknamed the Radiator. Probably Strachan described him as a right good teammate. Right imagine. good teammate, right. <laughs> But I apparently was called the radiator, but yeah. <laughs> nice. It's funny because, like, uh, Celtic always seems to be, like, you know, the bug you break up with and then you regret, it, like, six months later and you start texting yeah. when you're horny. Mm. Because, like, see when you, like, look at, like, Mark Butchell, and before he became a manager, he was playing in Thailand. And if you looked at his, like, uh, Twitter account, even though he was playing for a Thai team, he still with a Celtic, like, him in a Celtic strip as his Twitter picture. Yeah. And if you look at, like, Adam Virgo just now, He's got like a picture of himself as a Celtic player as his Twitter uh, picture. So yeah. I think it is something that lasts a long time. I mean, w- it, people say like, obviously, when Brendan Rodgers came in, it was uh, he, he knew what he was doing to an extent. I don't, I don't like being cynical, but like when he when he was delivering that speech, he kind of like paused after he said to, uh, uh, Tommy Burns' name because he knew what the reaction was going to be. So he can like I got a feeling he knew what he was knew what he was saying. Oh, I. But like, it is that way. It is like a kind of uh, you. You become part of a kind of. Uh, they were saying it's like for a people, and like it is for a people. You know, it's it's for like a certain group of people being a Celtic yeah. player. So. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, he 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 genuinely seemed to to enjoy his time as a Celtic player, and yeah, and I think he's deserved of of a certain status that some don't give him. Yeah. Um, in my opinion, anyway, I think that he he definitely contributed. Obviously, he won. Two in a row. He was part of no three in a row. He he didn't win the three in a row. I think he was part of two of the three in a row, which yeah. obviously is you know it's it's quite a big thing. He, he's he's actual tr- he's he actually won quite a lot of trophies in his time before he even came to Celtic. He won like um, four Dutch leagues, multiple Dutch cups, and then obviously came to Celtic. I mean, if if you if I was to say to you now. Got his stupid big face on my screen here. If I, was to, if I was to say to you now, we're going to sign a guy for Holland. He's still mid twenties. He plays for Holland. He's a striker and he's won the Dutch league four times. We 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 couldn't afford them. Right no, now. it's no crazy. Way. You know, it's just it's a it's a different thing. It's, it's yeah. a different thing altogether. But yeah, uh, yeah. He's, he, would you say he was your uh, favourite uh, Dutch Celtic player? Uh, Van Dijk, obviously, or, or, or even Van Hooydonk. If we want to go further back. What, what about uh, Reggie Blinker? Reggie Blinker, mate? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely not. I'll uh, tell you who should be up there, though. Bobby Petta. <laughs> Roberto Petta? Yeah. yeah. Uh, nah, I mean, obviously, these guys have their, have their place, but if you, if you were, it's a serious question, obviously, it's Van Dijk. He's just incredible. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, yeah. Van Hooy don't care for that. But as I say, uh, Vinegar is definitely... He's up there as someone who deserves a bit more respect from that era. Obviously, he was playing alongside fucking Kenny Miller, Silly and fucking Sheridan, <laughs> fucking Koki Mizuno and Doombe. And you know, I, I seen that he got substituted. I think it might even been the Hibs game. I'm not sure, but he came off the bench to replace Ben Hutchinson. Nice, nice. I think Ben Hutchinson's played in like some pub league down in England somewhere. He's not even like Vauxhall. Conference. He's not even like that level. He's probably like a bouncer from some bar. Uh, it's absolutely, it's absolutely incredible, really, how how we've had these players. But yeah, anyway. Oh, we forgot, we forgot about the kind of uh, Dutch number one, and that's Glenn Levens. Glenn Levens, oh my goodness. Glenn Levens was very, very close to playing in the, the richest, apparently the best league on the planet, just seven <laughs> days ago. 
but obviously that never transpired. He, he almost followed in the steps of a Jos Hoyveld who got there before him with Southampton. Jesus Christ, you've got a list. <laughs> you have a fucking list. Who else do we have in the list? I, I, I'm, I'm struggling to remember. Hoyveld. I think that's as far as I can go, man. Reggie Blinker, Bobby Pear. Remember that Bobby Pear was like uh, Reggie Blinker's understudy at one point? Yeah. Yeah. Similar style of players. Similar style of players, but yeah. Yeah. Right, I think that'll do us for the for the Gan Vinegar of Hesslink uh, kind of a chat. I, I think we, we both like uh, appreciate what he did for Celtic. I think I've got a bit of a more negative view of him overall than, yeah. than Tony has. What, what would you say about that? I, I, yeah, if you're going to be black and white about it, it's certainly negative. But yeah, hopefully this conversation has steered you towards I'm champion for, championing for Big Jan to be more respected. <laughs> Um, not necessarily putting the same bracket as a Sutton or anyone like that, or obviously a, a Lennon or even a Thompson, an Alan Thompson, mm-hmm. but it's someone who is thought of as quite fondly, and obviously he's he's got four relatively big goals. Another goal that we haven't spoken about, I just want to quickly mention, it was against Aberdeen. Do you remember this goal when he scored a back heel and to win the game in the last minute? And it was I think it was McGeady that set up, and it was I that, think that was was that the second game. Was that, Maybe think, it was it was the most outrageous back heel you've ever seen. It was incredible. I think I remember that. I think it was just after he joined. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think we should get on to uh, chatting about what's actually happening in the modern day at Celtic. Yeah. So uh, moving on to kind of like uh, the modern era of uh, Celtic. Obviously, we're doing this thing as uh, guys abroad. We don't get to every game. In fact. When it came to Ronnie Dyler, I think I I didn't actually witness a victory. I have I have to say that I was at the Legia home game. I was Oof. back in the summer uh, in, <laughs> at Murrayfield, and oh my god, I took the brazen bus through, <laughs> nice. the brazen heat bus through, <laughs> and uh, the rebels were blaring right. But that's fine. The rebels on the way there, I'm, I'm into that. But on the way back, the the gridlock, traffic jam, the Jesus. aircon was broke on the bus. And the rebels were blading, and the speaker had burst, and it was just like fuck. <laughs> obviously, the last thing you want to be doing after after an absolute horsing is being stuck in a bus that's far too hot with tunes that aren't really that are making they're not sounding as clear as they should be. And you're, and you're, you're sobering up, fucking <laughs> dehydrating. You're just like, oh my goodness, this is fucking horrendous. <laughs> but aye, so yeah, the modern era. Let's let's exclusively just talk about from like two weeks ago. Still <laughs> because the dialer thing has been done to death. Yeah, and exactly. Yeah. I think Rogers has also been done to death, but it would be nice just to hear. Um, obviously, as a Celtic fan yourself, living abroad, mm-hmm. where do you watch your games? I like. Uh, I lived in uh, Munich for four years, so we had like the for the first uh, three years we had the Shamrock Bar where we had this section uh, cordoned off for us. It was a big screen yeah. and everything. And yeah. then we, there was actually like, okay, well, you'll never walk alone, Celtic flags all over the place. But they got new management and they, 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 they stopped all that happening. So we ended up going to the, uh, probably some listeners will recognise it as uh, Killings or Ned Kelly's right in the centre of Munich, right next to the, the right. Frauenkirchen. And I didn't, I didn't like it so much there because you were, a lot of the times you were watching the games with like Huns. So right. there would be like uh, Celtic Rangers games on, and there would be like a kind of split crowd, and I'm really not into that, you know. Like I'm, nah, I'm not, the, I'm not, not the most bitter bastard in the world, but like I don't want to be watching a Celtic Rangers game with, with Rangers fans next to me. You know what I mean? I don't want to be doing that. Yeah. Never, ever, um, ever, 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 never. And then like I went back like just a, just a few months ago, it was a Celtic Aberdeen game, and there was like. Munich's changed over the last kind of eight years. I moved in two thousand eight. There's lots of people going there on stag weekends and stuff now. And there was like a big yeah. group. I, I think they were a mixture of Hearts and Rangers fans. And uh, I was just sitting watching the, the game with my Celtic top on, and they were like giving me a jip and things like that, and telling me to like get the Celtic top off and stuff like that. And it was just bad atmosphere. So since then, I've, Fine. I, was it? Yeah, yeah. So since then, I've moved to just north of Munich. So I've ended up just getting like Celtic TV and just just watching the games yeah. that way. Yeah. Um, what about yourself? In um, in Madrid, the Madrid Emerald CSC, the Trisco Tavern. Mm-hmm. If you are ever in Madrid, I recommend going to the uh, the Trisco Tavern. The guys in there are great, brilliant atmosphere. They really get, they really really try to create an atmosphere. I've never been in a CSC like it. Aye. They um they've got flags, strips. They put other strips on. Other bar staff get given strips when they come in. Um, 
Yeah, it's just a great atmosphere. They play the tunes, and there's guys like actively standing up singing like a game. I've never seen anything like nice, it. It's, it's, nice. it's great. They sell Guinness, they sell all your standard stuff, but that has a lot of um, tourists coming in, so it's regularly quite busy. Alternatively, you could call me a streamathy. <laughs> um, <laughs> I basically stream a lot of games on the internet. I had Celtic TV, but I had a lot of trouble with it. It was just fucking really shite for a while. It wasn't happening. Aye. So eventually, I, I had it, and it was just really, really bad. Like the quality of it wasn't just just not good enough. I don't know if it was down to my, I don't know, but I, I just ended up cancelling it at the end of last season. No. Um, and prior to that, uh, in Cambodia, um, <laughs> I lived in Cambodia for a bit. Uh, when I arrived in Cambodia, one of the first things a guy I knew in Cambodia was like, "There's a CSC here." I was like, "Fucking yes!" <laughs> and I think I think that was about three years ago. We were in the Champions League, and um, the CSC was called the Phnom Penh CSC, and it was ran by a guy who became a friend. His name's Angus, and his girlfriend, and um, they're no longer there, unfortunately. But it was a good wee CSC, and it was only about yeah, it was only it was only me and him and like two or three other people, including his girlfriend, okay. just, like, watching the games. But like watching the games at like 3 or 4 in the morning on a Tuesday <laughs> when I'm working at 8 it's just like fuck but anyway <laughs> yeah that's um, the, normally the Madrid what, have you so so you went back for Legia did you did you go back for any other games in the last couple of years I went back um, I went to a game at Christmas um, I can't remember when I went to games anytime I'm back in Glasgow I go to games whether it's a friendly last season I went to the friendlies at Love Street or oh, okay. whatever it's called I went to those games and um Against, I think it was Real Sociedad and a couple other games, but uh, there was a game at Christmas that I attended. But was it Ross County? It might have been. I also attended Malmo at home, and I attended. <laughs> You're a fucking I, jinx, man. <laughs> I attended Malmo at home, and I attended the Icelandic team. I can't even remember when that. Reykjavik. Yeah, I attended. So any any time I'm in Glasgow, I will attend the games. So I, 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 I'm, I'm the same. Like I got. Uh, I got the the game that I mentioned. I went back for Ross County, which was basically the game that we drew at home before the Ronald Dyla team started to play in the first season. You know, like yeah. Uh, so I, I went to that game, then I came back uh, to the Dundee United game at Tannadice. You know, when we played them like four or five, five times in a row. Five, yeah, yeah. I came back for the fucking draw in Tannadice, <laughs> and I went to Inter away uh, in Milan, which we went. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, so it, it, for for me it was quite easy because you just get the train from uh, Munich straight down. Oh, uh, yeah. So that was cool. Like wake, waking up on the on the overnight train, you're going by like Lake Garda and stuff like that. You know, it's, 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 it's it was pretty cool. Uh, so I, I I never I didn't see a win there at all. And then just uh, a few a few months ago, I came back from my brother's birthday and I got him uh, like the the expensive. You know, the you get the. In the bar and stuff, you know, like the club Celtic shit. Oh yeah, I've uh, yeah, yeah. got that for the Dundee game at home. Where we do what was it? Oh, nothing each. And we never had the fucking shot and go or something. So yeah, yeah. in the whole Roy really Dyla uh, rain, I saw them like four times. And I never saw a single win. Yeah, yeah. I thought that was the jinx, but really, <laughs> really not. But yeah, um, with regards to Brendan Rodgers, it's hard to really cover what's not been covered. But there is just a certain momentum around Celtic just now, which is. Obviously, the latest rumour, obviously, the, the most recent rumour that I've read is Stephen Fletcher again, which is, is lazy, can't just posting the same stuff over and over with regards to like him signing, but the Zlatters, Zlatan, <laughs> the, the odds, I think it was Paddy Power or something, they've stopped taking bets since Zlatan come to Celtic. I'd like, see, see if it happened though, like, it would be the greatest thing ever, but it's just no chance of it happening. I, can't, I mean, can, can you see it happening? Absolutely not. My mate's just sent us a photo there of Zlatan standing in George Square with his top off, holding a bag of <laughs> two bags, one with Aldi on it and one with Lidl on it, with his tap off. Brilliant, brilliant. George Square, I've no idea what's going on. That's definitely authentic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know, like, for me, when, when you look at, like, uh, uh, Rogers. He played, uh, at Swansea he played like the kind of, uh, I think it was Danny Graham up front. Yeah. So he played like the big man up front and then he played, yeah. he basically, uh, at Swansea he seemed to play like the, the, the round dial away, but with the big yeah. guy up front. Yeah. For for uh, Liverpool, he, he switched quite a lot. So I don't know, like, at Liverpool, I think uh, watching, uh, I watched some of those episodes of that being Liverpool thing after, yeah. after we got him. And... Yeah. Uh, it seemed to be that he got a lot of the kind of signings that Liverpool foisted upon him. Uh, it's, I think it's quite common knowledge that he had a, what do you call a transfer committee, where basically 
these guys just you know, s- scout all over the world, pick 10 players. Roger says, I need a left back, and they go, right, here's three, choose one. He doesn't actually Aye. send his guys out to choose a player. You know, he had like Markovic, Balotelli, you know, these players. I don't, none of these, obviously, Markovic played against Celtic last season for Fenerbahce, but obviously he was sent out in loan. And, um, yeah, I wouldn't read too much into that. I mean, to be honest with you, with, with Rogers, I, I don't know what to expect. Like, I don't know what formation, because I'm reading all these conflicting reports, so. Well, I mean, when when you think about it, like, Swansea must have been the last time that he got to play a, a formation with players that he, he wanted. But yeah. but then again, he only spent £12 million in two seasons. So yeah. was he only playing that formation because that's the, the players that he had? Yeah. So it's it's really fucking impossible to tell what he's going to play. And and I've I've been reading a lot of things like oh but he he just picked up where uh, whoever was before him Roberto Martinez because uh, he's uh, a fucking he just, good manager man. Yeah yeah he's he done all right I guess <laughs> uh, Everton and okay. but yeah like they're saying that he just picked up from where he left off and like almost discrediting Rogers for the the success he had with yeah. with Swansea but you don't get to move to Liverpool if you're you're shy you know what yeah I mean. I mean I don't know, like, he seems to want a kind of, like, uh, like he's always he's always, a, always had, like, Joe Allen in his team, so he seems to want someone, like, I know he, I know he, he compared... I'll be shite back in his team. <laughs> oh, I'll be shite back in. I know he compared uh, Joe Allen to, like, the Welsh Xavi, but, like, Joe Allen is that way when he gets the ball, his head's always in a swivel. And yeah. do we have anyone like that in uh, Celtic? Uh, maybe maybe uh, Rodrick? <laughs> Nah, Raj, Rogics is not as mobile as. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll be honest with you, I haven't saw much of Joanne. I saw him when he played in that UEFA final last week. But he's just, he seems to me like like that Chaviro, that small, you know, always looking for the pass, just roaming around a certain area and just distributing the ball, not doing anything too fancy. Um, and to be honest, I don't think we have anyone like that. Um, maybe McGregor. McGregor's probably more mobile. I, I think, think, like uh, on the on the huddle board, McGregor seems just seems to get so much shit. The main the main argument against McGregor is this is a quote. It's fucking Callum McGregor. I just don't see what the fuck that argument is. You know what I mean? It's like, what? In one hand, Celtic fans seem to want us to bring through our own players. But so, on the other hand, when we bring them through, then we we'll say, "Oh, it's fucking Callum McGregor." For me, Callum McGregor was one of our best midfielders last season. I absolutely agree with that. He, he he's another. I mean, we don't want to hop back to the Dyla chat because obviously we're we're we're, um, we're over that. But yeah. Dyla's legacy, McGregor is part of that. McGregor, especially McGregor, in that that uh, more kind of was John role. I mean, that yeah. wasn't something McGregor done before, you know. Yeah, you would never have. You would never have thought of McGregor replacing Brown. No, no. And obviously now the chat is. Wait a minute, he can actually play. Obviously, it was only a couple of games in the game. The games he played were pretty much meaningless but McGregor definitely has a future for Celtic and yeah I I, I just don't know what to expect when it comes to Rodgers though um, uh, yeah information just... is just like I wish I wish we knew what he was what kind of formation to expect yeah. but that's that's the kind of the, the kind of thing that's kind of uh, I like because we've got the, the players that we already have and then we've got uh, Asia coming in from uh, Norway I don't even know if that's how you pronounce them yeah. He's a he's a he's a football manager legend. That's all I know. <laughs> and uh, yeah. uh, Henderson coming back, so I just don't I don't know what like if it, if it was like a dialer formation, then in those two withdrawn roles, I would like to see McGregor taking one of them. Yeah, and then no, you, then you've got like Asia Henderson Brown and Beaton going for one position. It's really hard to see what's going to happen in our, our track record of bringing in young players and playing them regularly to begin with is I don't think is very good so if Asia's going to come in although he played 30 odd games this season mm-hmm. and he was captain of his team in the, the top week in Norway he has to have something about him Yeah. Um, I don't foresee him making any sort of impact this season uh, I, I, I don't, again it's just I'm just saying what I think and just the track record seems to suggest not, but I, I just it's fucking closed season is fucking just itching. There's no football on this weekend, as far as I know. Like I know there's friendlies, but fuck that. But <laughs> I'm like last weekend we had the Euro, the, the Champions League, but I'm just choking for forget all the friendlies. Just say, let's get back to it, man. That that Champions League, I had 50, 50 euros on the uh, Atletico, man. Oh really? Mm-hmm. Excellent. I just thought I just had a feeling they were going to do it, but they fucking shat it again. What odds did you get on that? It was eleven to four or something, but that was within the ninety minutes. 
yeah. always within it's normally always within the ninety minutes. Uh, yeah, unless you're betting them to win the trophy. Yeah, but uh, I like I I don't know about you, but like I'm a big big fan of Tom Rogic. Like I would be, I would be building a team around Tom Rogic if I if I were the Celtic manager. But then again, looking at like uh, Rogers' teams in the past. A player like uh, Stefan Johansson seems to be the kind of player that he likes to have in that position. Yeah. I've seen that Johansson captain Dan scored for Norway two days ago. Aye. I think he, I'm pretty certain he scored. I've seen on Twitter he was definitely captain. But, but um, what, do, what I mean, like, because the Celtic fans have been totally over the top about Johansson this season. Do you think he's shy and should be binned, or do you think it's just a kind of one one season blip? Well, if it was a one season blip this year, maybe his purple patch was the season, the one season yeah, maybe, blip last yeah. year. Maybe we've just got the real him now, but it's really hard to say. But you would need to give him the benefit of the doubt because the way it's panned out with Dyler, um, you know, it never really worked out the way we, everyone expected it to. So maybe with a new manager, maybe things will change, which maybe says a wee bit about the player if he's not playing for the manager. Yeah, but I would, I I would love to see Dyler brought in as like academy director or something. I think I think there's a lot of um, chat about that, and it's never going to happen. But just take that sideways step and back about 100 yards. Yeah. <laughs> it's not exactly a sideways step when you're going down to play with the youths and train the youths and that. But yeah, I mean, obviously, the chat is that the Celtic youths, uh, the changes Dyla made from top to bottom, like, has, has changed the club. Like, the under-17s went undefeated all season there, and you just see our, our, our youth teams regularly doing Aye, the, the doing under- other teams. So, uh, future, uh, Brendan, what, do you, what what is your kind of... Uh, uh, we see a lot of kind of different expectations for this season. Do you think uh, what, what are your expectations? Do you think uh, Champions League? Do you think Europa League? I mean, I think it's only fair that you give them the same expectations that you gave the last manager for the first season, and that's just you know, uh, I'm not going to say a treble because that's near enough impossible. All I'm going to say is a domestic double would be great. Um, ideally, the Scottish Cup, and at least a decent challenge in the Europa mm-hmm. and by that I mean if the group stages and we put in a good performance then great but ideally get into the last 16 or whatever it is after the group stages of, of the, the Europa League for me that would be I'm not expecting things to that's one of the issues I have with, with, with Rogers coming in people like the expectation bar is extremely fucking high Aye. and I just you know it's just that high it's just potential to fucking you know if if he, if if shit doesn't happen, it's going to be a fucking redneck. So, I just want to keep it quite sensible. A domestic double would be fantastic, and a decent showing in the Europa League, and then build on that because it, a manager's first season is never really, you know, it's kind of just like just get get in there and get the first year out the road, and then start building from there. Aye. Yeah, I can see like the the uh, I don't know like for me like the if if we if we go into the Europa League. I would see not coming out of the Europa League group as a bit of a failure. Yeah. Like, uh, if, we, if we go down to the Europa League, I would expect post-Christmas uh, football at least. Yeah. I mean, that for me, as I say, like, I'm always, like, um, I don't want to sound negative, but I just like to try and be level-headed. Like, Champions League's an absolute bonus right now. It's an absolute fucking huge bonus for us if we get that. And it's not the end of the world if we don't get it. Depending on the manner, obviously, of how we don't Aye. reach there. But if it's five now against Legia, then <laughs> it, or if it's like the whole Malmo debacle or the fucking or even the the Mulder ones, like these guys gave me nightmares. But as you say, post Christmas, a, a post Christmas European adventure would be fucking amazing. Aye. But this season, I'm willing to like take it easy, and and obviously we have a relatively strong league next season with Aberdeen pushing on, and Hearts are looking good. And uh, obviously, we did cunts present coming, in a league coming up yeah. for the first time. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, obviously, there's an extra that, but obviously, the, the season tickets have been in huge demand, and I'm really excited about the whole season. So I don't think the season is necessarily about winning everything and doing that. It's just more about bringing back the unity and getting a good feel about the club. And then next season would be the what? Well, not this season, but the following season next year would be the one where I'm like, right, let's fucking do it. On paper, though, like any Celtic team with the kind of uh, the financial backing that we have, should be taking a, a Malmo, should be taking a Maribor, 
You know, I mean, like we should we should be doing this. We should be qualifying for yeah. Europe. You know, it's just a case of like, obviously, football is not played in paper. So yeah. I was at Maribor as well, by the way. So. <laughs> I was back in Glasgow for like a two week window, and I managed to go to these games that just fucking ruined my entire stay, <laughs> my entire two week back in town. But anyway, um, <laughs> obviously the, the, the finances thing is there, but everyone's going on about Leicester. So I, who the fuck knows? It's obviously the organisation that we're. Uh, there were a lot of issues with organisation last year, obviously Chris Commons, which is another talking point. I see that uh, there's chat about him leaving, and I'm a big fan of Chris Commons. I think he's one of our most important players. Certainly, of the Venegar status, like he's a cut, he's a he's a modern day great. I think Chris Commons, his record is amazing, 500 grand, etc. The chat about him going to Rotherham. What, what, what do you think of that? Would you? Um, shift? I, I know, I know that you're a Chris Commons fan, uh, but I'm, I'm not a Chris Commons fan, and I'll tell you why. Because I think that Chris Commons plays the game for himself, and that any time Chris Commons plays well, it's, I, I feel as if it's at the detriment to Celtic as, as an actual football team. Like, I feel as if he, he takes on the games, and uh, only, only kind of. Uh, I think Chris Commons seems to be only interested in himself during games. Yeah. Like, I, I I always say that uh, Chris Commons will shoot from any fucking angle. You know what I mean? Like he'll just shoot from impossible angles. And I think yeah. the value, like for the, for the money that we paid for him, I think that's fucking awesome. But again, like if you, if you're building a, if you're building a team in a formation, like if if you were doing like the dialer thing of trying to have a formation set, I don't think players like Chris Commons would actually would actually get near the team because. He, he doesn't fit a formation. Yeah. Whereas with someone like Neil Lennon, Neil Lennon was basically putting the players on the pitch with no formation and saying, there you go, just go and play a game. And that was yeah. fine for Neil Lennon at the time. But, I don't know, like... I mean, for me, I just think, if you're going to score that amount of goals, and, you know, he's he's a weird-shaped guy, you know, kind of overweight-looking, but mm-hmm. he just has this knack of scoring important goals as well. I'm quite happy to keep him at the club. He's not going to cost us any money to keep him at the club. Obviously, we, we would get a ridiculously small fee anyway. There's no harm in keeping him. But again, it just all comes back to what the manager wants to do and about the, the response, the, what he wants. And I will trust the manager. If, if the manager decides that Commons isn't you know, going to work, then he'll get rid of him. Then I'll, I'll support that. Yeah, you have to look at, like, uh, it's not just a case of, like, uh, can we afford to keep a player? It's like who 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 is Chris Commons stopping from getting into the team? I think he's at the age though where he's not going to be starting games and he's just going to come off as a come off the bench as like a, as a super sub or whatever you want to call it because he has a goal on him as you say. He pings them in. I definitely. There's been games where like we're chasing a goal and he's just like picking the ball up for thirty five yards and hitting a shot. I remember like at the, at the the San Siro, we we were sitting in the the, the inter oh, and amongst the inter fans, and when he came off the bench, I was like to him, "That's it, man. We're going to fucking fuck his now. He's just going to score. It's just going to shoot from anywhere." Because that's what you expect from him, and you expect he's just going to batter it in from anywhere. Yeah. But like that's for me, that's not football because that's not a team. That for me, Chris Commons plays like a non-team sport because you, you don't tend to find Chris Commons setting up many goals he just seems to get the ball and then he bang it's a goal and it's effective Yeah. but like I don't know like if you look at so just say we imagine like we're not we're not keeping the listeners much longer here but like if you imagine Celtic to be playing like a, a dialer type formation because I've got a feeling that's what Brendan's going to go for when you look at the three behind the striker You've got in the, in that central part because there's no point playing Commons in the wing because it's just it can't move as much. Yeah. And in, in that central part, you've got Rogic, you've got Johansson, and then you've got some you've got players that want to play like Scott Allen as well. Mm. And it's, I, it's 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 mental how many we have. Yeah, I mean even even players like Christie, Christie's probably a central uh, attacking mid as well. And uh, I heard like in, in in interviews that Patrick Roberts would want, want to play central as well. You know what I mean? So like, I don't know. Like, I think it's just time. Uh, like, I think it's time to thank Chris Commons for what he's done for us and just say, uh, go in a free man, just enjoy the rest of your career. Yeah, I, I, he is tied to Celtic with his wife though, and I think yeah. There's I read today that there's chat about him like becoming a. a a member of staff or something like that because I'm not sure he fancies going down and you know playing for Rotherham with Stubbs no. but 
Uh, as I say, like, it, it just comes down to what the manager thinks, and I'll trust the manager. It was always for me, like, because uh, I, I, I don't know about you, but I was totally against like Neil Lennon coming back. Because I just feel like Neil Lennon, if Neil Lennon came back, he would just put together a 4 4 2. He would just bring back 4 4 2. Chris Commons would have been the team he would, he would uh, recall Anthony Stokes. Mm. And it would just go back to this kind of football that is uh, effective sometimes, but is. It is, it's in no way developing ourselves as a yeah. football club, you know what I mean? Yeah, Flintstones material. I mean, the fact that Lennon has been uh, linked with the Hibs job and he's in talks with him right now. Aye, that's just fucking weird, you know what I mean? Like, th- for me, like, this is getting totally off topic, but, like, Lennon, he, d- he did well for us, he won us some trophies, but he was in a perfect position to develop our players and he developed absolutely fuck all. Yeah, I, I I don't think he had it in him. He was he's a young coach. I don't know if he had it in him to necessarily do that because it was his first gig and it was. Sick. Uh, I could be, but like it felt at times like because 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 Huns were gone, we we were basically playing a league against no one, and instead of trying to like blood youngsters, he was chasing these records like these fucking thirteen clean sheets in a row and stuff like that. And it was like fucking get a grip. We're twenty yeah. points clear. Just start fucking bring Kieran Tierney. Bring Kieran Tierney into the team. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like just bring these players in. Yeah, but but yeah, the 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 hype around the club just now is is amazing. And I still can't believe we got Rogers. Still can't believe it. Ah, uh, like uh, that was one of those things where I thought, no, there's no chance. Like yeah. even when people before that were saying like David Moyes, I was like, no, there's no chance. David Moyes. I I totally expected us to appoint someone like John Hughes. Yeah, I agree as well. Yeah, my, I had arguments with my friends and WhatsApp. I flat out like, there's no fucking way we are going to spend two and a half million on a on a manager. But when when you it's, when you see the amount of like say like kind of uh, buzz it creates, like the season tickets basically pays for that. Exactly. And I know I know Celtic haven't wanted to do this. Like there's some kind of theories that Celtic have been like. Uh, I saw today someone was talking about how Celtic have just been like. Uh, holding back over the last few years because they knew that they could win the league without spending any money. A, a Scrooge McDuck vault, uh, a fucking ex- vault, ex- ex- swimming in coins. Exactly, and then when 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 the monkeys come into the league, then we start we start back again. But like I don't like I don't know. It's people. I don't know. That's the thing. Like people talk about, oh, why the fuck is John Kennedy still at the club? Because, but people have no clue what John Kennedy does for Celtic. And it's the, the misconception is he was a defender, therefore he was a defensive. It's coach. fucking bullshit, you know what I mean? Like, and there's, we have we've got no concept about what's actually been happening in the background. Have we been investing money in youth? I know we've set up this thing with with St. Ninians, and there's people coming up coming out and saying like Celtic will win the Champions League in the next fifteen years because of the youth the youth policy. And see, see, the thing is, in twenty years, if we look back in this time and, and people say to us, we never spent much money in that time because we were doing this. And because we knew we were in the league, people would be looking back on that and thinking they were fucking geniuses, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, another thing that we never mentioned was, uh, of, and I've not really spoke to many people about it, but Jack Aitchison. Um, the goal oh, yeah, yeah. Sport. Obviously, it's a long time ago now and it was under Dyler, but, you know, that, again, Dyler's legacy for me will be what he done with certain players that, like Tierney, McGregor, Aitchison to an extent, and brought them through and. Um, he only ruined it at the end by saying that he was an Arsenal fan. I mean, what the fuck? <laughs> but yeah, like, people forget yeah. like fucking uh, near Beton as well. Like near Beton was nowhere yeah. near the the, the, the Lennon team. You know, Griffiths. Ah, uh-huh. like, th- these guys they were no, nowhere near the, near the team. So yeah, yeah. But yeah, it's, it's uh, arguably the best time to be a Celtic fan. It's been it's been the best um, for a long time. And um, yeah, and it's. As we were speaking about, obviously being the boys abroad and that, it's you're just like fuck. I wish I was there, man. You know, you seen the 13,000 people up at Parkhead, and it's like bastards. I had a fucking tear in my eye, man. I was like, I was. I was in work. <laughs> I was fucking working. I couldn't see a thing. Uh, I was. I, I like. I was. Uh, I just finished. Uh, it was like four o'clock my time, so it was like yeah. three o'clock uh, British time, and I was. A student was talking to me, and I was like, "Fucking get on with this, man!" And then uh, he go home and watch this fucking live stream. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah. but when I when I started watching it, and I was like, "Man, 
this is this is what it means, you know, and this is this is what these guys are getting into. And I know it's like fucking sentimental, meaning the Celtic way and all that stuff. But like that's it's it's especially when you move abroad, and there'll be guys that listen to the show that have actually moved abroad and will feel the same way. But I think you become more passionate about your team when when you're not there. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah, it's it's a, it's a weird situ- situation to be in because like when I'm walking about in the summer here in Germany, like I just I just rotate between Celtic tops when I'm walking yeah. about the streets, and I know like uh, people say, oh, uh, Grun Grun mentioned they're wearing Celtic tops and stuff, but like I just you have to fucking represent, man. There's <laughs> a difference between wearing a Celtic strip, going to Aldi, and, <laughs> and, and walking about Munich, drinking beers, and it's the same when Brendan Rodgers got announced. I'm not going to even deny it. I stuck my Celtic strip on and I just went to the pub and I was like, fuck you, yes. <laughs> exactly. Got, yeah. you know, it was fucking amazing. But, yeah, <laughs> so the, the, we're, we're basking in this this posi- uh, positivity and um, long may continue. I'm just, I, I, as I say, obviously we've got the Euros coming up, but I just want to get back to the, the real football of the Celtic. Uh, yeah, I don't, I, international football, I think it's because we're Scottish. It's just never really interested me because of... yeah. There's all, there's always problems with Scotland as well. Like it's, I would love I would have loved Scotland to get independence because then you, you then you could feel like fucking Scottish. I think for 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 guys like us, we just don't feel like a nationality at all. You know, like we just don't feel yeah. like anything. But uh, the Euros get that out of the way. I'll, I'll be probably supporting Germany throughout it. And uh, yeah, uh, but I don't know. Like what what about you? Are you going to be supporting Spain? I will support Spain. I'll be spending half of it. Uh, in Spain and then the other half I'm going back to Glasgow but normally support Germany but obviously being in Spain I, I want Spain to win but yeah uh, that's that's for another time we can talk about that there's still still loads to be talked about regarding the, the Euros I'm, I'm extremely excited about seeing what happens with certain players Celtic have only got one player being represented and that's Lustig oh god man and but... you know <laughs> even like there's, I think someone said that the Scottish League has 11 or 12 representatives at that tournament. It's more than Holland and Belgium combined. Ah, uh, it's crazy. Yeah, yeah. Fucking inc- it's mental. Aye, uh, uh. Anyway. So I think we should wrap it up there. Like, uh, if you want to get in yep. touch with us, it's it's kind of a weird situation on, on Twitter because I wanted to make it like at History Boys Abroad, but that was too long. And I wanted to make it at History Boys and that was already taken. So I made it at Boys Abroad, Boys with an H. And then after yep. after we made that, I realised it sounds like a kind of like dating service. <laughs> Grinder. <laughs> yeah, like basically, let's find boys when we go abroad. <laughs> but, but but it's not a dating service. I I can't. I can only speak for myself. Tony, are you going to date anyone from this? No. No. So it's not a dating service. But if you want to get in touch with us, it's at Bahoys Abroad uh, yep. on Twitter. Uh, we don't we don't have a website, but we will be giving you links on on the Twitter of how to get in touch with us uh, for downloading the episodes and stuff like that. So, yep. Next week, I don't know what we're going to talk about, uh, but it won't be Jan Vinegar of Hesling because he certainly won't be Jan Vinegar because no. he's 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 gone. He's he's in the vault. Yeah. So yeah, I, I enjoyed this first episode. I hope you guys did too. Uh, so yeah. that's a, a goodbye from me. Thank you very much, and goodbye from me.
great to be alive Takes the skin right off my hide To think I'll have to give it all up someday